Wondering what life is really like on Canada's wild and crazy West Coast? This podcast is all about the people, the places, and Vancouver Island time. Together, we'll explore this island paradise, a combination of ocean, city, and country living. We'll meet the fabulous locals such as the Fudge Fairy and the Chicken Lady who have chosen Victoria and Vancouver Island as their home. And we'll learn what makes this place unique and special to those who live here. And now, your host of Vancouver Island Time, Jane Johnston. Hi, it's Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun and host of Vancouver Island Times. I'm here with Kathy Scott, who is the director or principal or president of, what is your title? I call myself the CEO, Chief Exploration Officer. Excellent. So she's the Chief Exploration Officer of Departures Travel and Niche Travel. So tell me, um, we are in Maplewood, which is a lovely area. You've got a beautiful Playfair Park behind us. What uh, made you choose to live here? And maybe you can sort of explain geographically where it is in the city and how you, how you came to here. I think um, the best way to describe where we are is we're right in between, we're really close to the Quadra Mackenzie Junction, um, a little bit closer up toward Tattersall and of course right beside Playfair Park. Um, it's beautiful here. It's a, it's a great central location. I think for me the reason that I moved here initially was I was putting my daughter into St. Margaret's School and it's close to that. It was central in between. I grew up, or didn't grow up, but I lived in the Sandwichton area for years and years. So um, we, when we decided to move to town, I wanted to be close to that, close to the airport because I, I'm in the business, and also close to everything else downtown. So what I find about living here is we're right smack in between everything. I always say we're 10 minutes to anywhere in Victoria, which I love. Um but, you know, seriously, it's longer than 10 minutes. It takes me 12 minutes to get to my, my office in Oak Bay. It takes me 20 minutes to get out to my office in um, Sydney. Oh, maybe I should say 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> um, so everything's really close, which I really love. And, and also just if I'm heading up island, we're already on the junction. We don't have to go through the city. So I really like it. It's great. How long have you been here? About 13 years. Do you find the demographics have changed? Because like I found since I got into real estate that a lot of people who are looking for this area are going to UVic. Yeah. Or they have kids in the schools. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, when I first moved into this neighborhood, all of my neighbors were predominantly retired older people. And when I when I look out the window right, right now, there's young families and there's a lot of them here. So I think... There's a lot of good schools right in the neighborhood. UVic is really close. It's one bus ride away. Um, it, yeah, it's if you're going to, we've got a lot of uh, foreign students in the area that, that come and stay. So they're really close to all the schools. So very well located. Yeah, and they also um, changed the zoning to allow for suites. So I think that that's allowed for a lot of development in the area. Hence more students, don't you think? I think probably. I do see a lot more of that now. And um, so what schools are in the area? Do you know? There is, well, St. Margaret's, of course. There is Reynolds School, um, St. Andrew's School, that one. Um, there is Cedar Hill School. So there's quite a few right in the neighborhood. And Brayford Elementary. Brayford Elementary as well, yeah. So um, I initially got, an, uh, I guess, introduced to this area when I was coaching baseball, and I find a lot of kids uh, play at Brayfoot Elementary. There's also um, the high school right around the corner from there, which is known for its band program. Um, what about in terms of things to do other than school, uh, like recreationally around here? There's the Galloping Goose Trail and Lockside Trail. We're right on the goose. I, I go one block down the street, um, and right at the bottom, there's the goose, so it's fantastic. And it's about a 15 to 20 minute bike ride into town along the goose, so no need to go on the busy streets. And um, the other direction, you're straight out to Sydney, and it takes about, from here, about 55 minutes on the bike uh, to, straight to Sydney. So it's lovely to go out to the Thursday night markets out there. I could ride my bike to work if I wanted. <laughs> so the Galloping Goose Trail is a trail that goes from downtown Victoria. It's an old railway line that goes out to Souk. So you can literally, it's probably like uh, 
35 to 50 kilometers, I think. I think it's longer than that because it goes right out to Souk as well. So it starts it starts at the ferry basically and goes all the way out to Souk. So probably 60 kilometers. Oh, you mean uh, uh, from up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The one just to um, from here to Sydney, I don't know what it, 20, something like that. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, eating, uh, there's a keg nearby, which is popular. Where else um, do you like to eat in the area? Well, again, we're so central, it's not difficult to get anywhere. I pop down to Uptown quite a bit. There's, you know, Brown Social House. There's some great little takeaways out there. A great Indian place. Been four. So that's really close. The keg's great. I can walk. It, you know, it takes me a couple of minutes so I can stagger. Um, and there's a great little Korean place. There's lots. There's great restaurants right here. And we're really close to Royal Oak. So it's actually walkable to go to Royal Oak and go to Fireside Grill, Med Grill, any of those if you want to do a nice half hour walk in the evening. Um, what do you think is like a secret hidden sh- treasure about this area that people don't know about? Well, you alluded to it earlier, Playfair Park. I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful 10 acre park filled with giant old rhododendrons. Um, You can walk under them blooming over top of you in the spring. So it's pretty nice. It's an off leash dog park. So I see two to three times a day, there's people that come um, and they've got to be great friends. They bring their dogs. I have dog envy, so I get to go watch the dogs there, which is really nice. I don't have a dog at the moment, but yeah, it's a beautiful park. And it's got great swing sets. Um, It's just lovely. Um, If somebody were trying to decide to move to Victoria as compared to any other city in Canada, like let's say Vancouver, what would you say to them? Why, Why move to Victoria? Well, I was born here, so I guess I'm a little bit prejudiced, but I would say Victoria, it's just lifestyle. We, we have it here. It's, we have everything that Vancouver has to offer, but our pace of life can be slower if you want. It can be a rat race if you want that too. But, you know, you look at just the traffic alone. It's, as I say, 10 minutes to anywhere. It's pretty remarkable to be able to do that. And even in the worst rush hour traffic, if I decide to head out um, right during rush, rush hour traffic up island, it's still not bad. I mean, it takes an extra half hour, but it's not like you're going to sit in traffic for two hours. What I like about it, what about the weather? What do you find about the weather? Well, we have this little secret microcosm here. And even within Victoria, we have little microcosms. So it can be beautiful and sunny here and raining out the peninsula and vice versa. So, But we get a lot less rain, a lot less fog, Um, a lot more sun than anywhere else, I think, in BC. So um, one of the things about what you do is travel, and you travel a lot. So how does, um, when you're talking about lifestyle in Victoria, how does it compare to other famous cities or like any any, uh, waterfront cities? I think we've, we're world class. I mean, I say that every time I go away, I love to travel, obviously, that's why I'm in the business. And I've been to some pretty spectacular destinations. But every time I get off the plane, when I get home, I am, I think how lucky and blessed I am to live here. We have an absolutely world class city. And all of our amenities, everything that we have here, you can you, it's not comparable to anywhere else. I really noticed that when we have events like we did this past weekend, Canada Day celebrations and everybody's downtown, uh, I find it a very safe place to live. It is. It's very safe. I mean, we have some of the small crime that you see anywhere in some of the larger centers, but on such a smaller scale. And yeah, I feel safe walking downtown at night. I walk around my neighborhood. It's fine. So one of the things um, I notice whenever I get off the plane is the smell of the air. Do you? I love it. Just love it. Yes. I walk off and it's the first thing I notice. It's fresh, it's clean, and it's home. Yeah. Okay. So um, what about other areas of the city that you lived in? Tell me about Saanichton. Saanichton is actually where all of my family is from. We're fifth generation here. Well, my kids are. Um, I love Saanichton. It's great. And I, I highly recommend it. For me, it's better to live in town because I'm in central between my two businesses. I also really like to be able to hit the restaurants and, and just walk downtown if I feel like it. It's about an hour from here to walk right downtown. Um, but Saanichton is a beautiful countryside destination. We had acreage out there, which I loved. So it's nice if you're into horses and um, any of that sort of thing. It's, it's beautiful.
it's kind of like a little um, hamlet within um, a rural area. Wouldn't you describe it that way? It is. There's a lot of great amenities. And again, restaurants, um, it's, you know, Sandish and Brentwood are side by side. So um, you can, you feel like it's all sort of one, but yeah, it's a, it's a great little destination. And I think it's probably a little more affordable than living right downtown as well. So if you don't need to live close in, I think what I noticed in the last few years that I did live there was there was a lot of families, larger families moving into the area and buying larger homes out there. And I think for a family lifestyle, it doesn't, you can't beat it. Yeah. And I like the fact that actually even living in Victoria proper, it only takes 50 minutes to go to a rural area, but Saanichton is actually completely surrounded by the the farmland. I have some clients who are looking up there, but I find just, um, Central Sandwich is quite expensive because it's flat and arable land, but the housing in these little hamlets is is still affordable. Um, so if you were to move to another area of the city after here, where would you pick? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I love all of the waterfront, but for me personally, I, I like being inland a bit more because I'm a gardener. Um, I would say probably maybe Oak Bay. I really do like Oak Bay. I, I mean, I say that partly because I work there. So that's maybe it. Um, I also really like the Fernwood and May, or Fernwood and um, yeah, Fernwood area. So it's kind of a bit funky, whereas Oak Bay is more traditional. Yes, I like the funkiness. I like the funkiness of the houses. I do love the, the big old heritage homes in Oak Bay. I think they're just beautiful. Probably too big for me, but beautiful homes. Well, you have a beautiful home here with your character coved ceilings, I find, and your wood trim and everything. It looks great. Um, okay, so let, let's just uh, go back a bit to the gardening. Uh, what do you find? Like, what are the seasons for gardening? Because they're, to me, they're completely opposite of what they were from where I came from in Toronto. So, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I actually garden year round. I mean, I don't do a lot in the winter time, but there are things you can do. I have a greenhouse, so I extend my season quite, quite far. But I mean, you know, kale, those sorts of things. I mean, pick them year round in the garden. So we're pretty fortunate with that here. Um, so I always uh, like to send pictures back east of uh, me mowing the lawn in November. <laughs> and that's just mean. <laughs> that's just mean. <laughs> and uh, the flower count in the spring. That's a fun one too. <laughs> So spring here is when for gardeners? I would say for me, it starts around February. That's when I start really getting excited and getting out there in the garden. Um, and it lasts right through to probably November. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of nice to take a few months off in the winter, but you can still, I mean, I actually get out there in the dead of winter and, and do stuff as well. It's not like we get snow. Yeah. So what does the dead of winter mean here for people who aren't from here? Well... We get pretty excited when we see snow on the ground because it's very rare. And if it stays for a day or two, that's even more rare. So, I, you know, once or twice a year, we get a bit of snow and, um, you know, it can get cold. So that's, and I like that. The clear cold is really nice. Um, the, the downside to here is it can be a little bit damp in the winter because we get a little more rain than you would do. I used to live in Nelson area, so we definitely get more rain than that. Um, but the upside is no shoveling. <laughs> no spring thaw. <laughs> what I find too is uh, we really do have four seasons um, and the summers are like completely clear and well, they're windy maybe, but there's no rain. Yeah, for sure. So we're used to having brown grass is what I'm saying in the summer because a lot of people don't even irrigate because we're on an island with the water restrictions, right? Do you irrigate? I irrigate just my my vegetable and flower beds, but I don't, my lawns, they get a bit of overspray, but no, I don't. I think, um, I think you just have to learn to love brown lawns. It's environmentally friendly that way. All right. So that's a great introduction to Victoria and the neighborhood of, uh, Maplewood. If you're interested in learning more, you can give me a call. I'm Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Comosin. We're just going to take a break. And then when we come back, we'll be talking about departures, travels and niche travel, which I want to hear more about. And, uh, Kathy will give us, um, 
some examples of some tours that she's doing with locals in the area. So take care. Vancouver Island Time is brought to you by the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camos in Victoria, where we bring local expertise and global presence to your property. Hi, everybody. It's Jane Johnson with the Briar Hill Group and host of Vancouver Island Time. I'm here with Kathy Scott, who is the Chief Exploration Officer of Niche Travel and Departures Travel. So tell us, um, tell us the difference between the two of them. Well, simply, um, Niche Travel is a tour company and Departures Travel is a full-service travel agency. So they really do work kind of closely together because we sell the tours through Departures Travel as well. Okay, so what does it, what does a tour company, so I'm not in the business, so tell me what does a tour company do? Um, a tour company really does everything other than air. So... Um, what what we specialize in at Niche is both women's tours around the globe, which is my baby, and what I'm really passionate about. And um, we do luxury inbound tourism of Victoria. So that means if, if people are coming here to Victoria, we will take care of their on-the-ground experiences here, including their hotels, transportation, any um, private excursions they want to do, that sort of thing. So give give me an example of a private excursion. Okay, well, um, we have a lot of people, of course, we're Garden City, so we have a lot of people that are very interested in the gardens here, so we have um, private guides that we use that will take them into, instead of going to butcher gardens, which of course they probably will go to as well, we would have them go into private gardens of Victoria, so into some beautiful homes in the uplands, um, Oak Bay area, and around the city. Um, we may take them to the horticultural center as opposed to butcher gardens and have a naturalist there work with them or a gardener and talk directly to them. So they really get into the heart of things with us. Um, they meet the locals, they meet the owners of the properties, um, they may have champagne on site or a lovely lunch included, that sort of thing. Oh, that sounds absolutely lovely. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's a local. What about your your women's travel tours? Because uh, that's that's what I know you more for. Right. Well, I've been doing that for fifteen years, so it's it's uh, something that I've done for a long time. Um, I just got back from a fantastic tour to Italy. So we went, and this would be very typical of one of our tours. We went into. Um, Tuscany and we did some truffle hunting with this amazing little dog and uh, we ate truffles and we um, we found truffles which was really exciting um, and then we went and we we went to a gentleman's home who does um, cheese making pecorino and we um, watched him actually make cheese from start to finish we had a beautiful multi-cheese course lunch afterward with wine of course and we stayed in a, a lovely villa in the Tuscany Hills and just wandered into beautiful little um, hamlets inside of Italy. And we had a private guide throughout, so we really learned a lot about the destinations. And we ended up in the Cinque Terre, and a lot of it was, um, we did cooking classes and um, met local artists and historians and just learned lots of stories. So that's the kind of thing we do. It's all small group, private tours and 12 women maximum plus either myself if I'm the tour host or one of my lovely tour hosts and um, yeah we do lots of destinations all over the world and how do you how do you source out you know do you go ahead of time and meet people in the area and like figure out what the highlights are how do you source out what to do with these guests well one of the benefits that that um, I have as a travel agency is I work with, um, we're part of a consortium called Ensemble Travel, and they have sourced them all for us. So we don't have to go there and do that ourselves. We have private guides and private tour companies in every destination pretty much in the world that I can pick up the phone and talk to, and they create the experiences that I want. So I'm very clear on the experience that we want. I just don't necessarily know what I don't know. So there might be some different things in that destination that I haven't seen before or I don't know about, and that's their job to make sure we see those things. So what, um, I know typical destinations are for you, Italy, um, I think France, India, where else have you gone with people? Well, where haven't we gone, really? <laughs> so this year, um, I was in the, in the Arctic last year, which was amazing. I did an Arctic expedition with a bunch of women. 
Um, I'm personally hosting uh, Thailand, Bhutan, um, and a Mekong River cruise, which is Vietnam and Cambodia still this year. So busy year ahead of me. We've also got South Africa this year, um, Morocco next year. We, we do sort of everywhere. Um, I'm going to be taking a group to the Antarctica in 2020. So um, I know we have different tour hosts that take different destinations. And who's your ideal client for, for these sorts of tours? I always say 18 to 80, but the reality is I'm kind of right smack in the middle of of our demographic. At 40? At, at 25 again. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm 57. So I'm right in the middle. We have women, you know, the youngest that really can kind of afford our tours are usually around the 40 mark. And we have women that'll go right up to 80. And I would say even beyond, the big thing with our tours is because they are are small and private, they don't always have, um, and we do four-star boutique hotels, we don't always have a concierge or somebody that can pack bags. So everybody has to be able to pack their own stuff. That's the big thing. And, and walk fairly good distances because we do a lot of walking and um, not hiking, you know, so that you don't have to be a hiker, but you have to be able to walk. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few difficult questions and she doesn't know that they're coming. So best meal you've had? Oh, wow. India, for sure. We had, I think it was Southern India and we actually ate with our hands and it was just a big tray of the most amazing stuff I've ever had. I can't even tell you what it was because it was all in a language I don't speak, but it was absolutely phenomenal and we ate with our hands and it was just amazing. Best view ever? I think probably the plains of Began in Myanmar. Absolutely stunning. We went on the top of old um, temples and we looked out and it was just absolutely stunning. There's thousands of beautiful old temples there and um, flat. It's quite flat. So you really see them all popping out in the distance. And if you've ever, if you haven't seen the plains of Began, Google it and you'll know what I'm talking about. It's just stunning. Is it, is it rice paddies or? No, it's just beautiful, arid. It's not desert. It's um, sort of a, a dry jungle. And um, the buildings are all, the, well, we always go in the sort of a sunset time. And so they're glowing. So these, these beautiful temples that are kind of a, an orangey color are popping out all over the place. And there's thousands. And it's just absolutely beautiful. Okay. Um, most surprising experience you had? We crashed a wedding in India. Are we One of the things that I always ask for in our tours is unique experiences um, where we go. So our tour guides are always on the lookout for these unique experiences. I had asked if it would be possible to include a wedding in India. I thought that might be fun, but there wasn't any that they knew of when we were going. So we were driving through a, a little rural village and all of a sudden the tour guide said, stop the bus. And there was a wedding taking place. And the next thing you know, she's telling us to get off the bus. And I'm like, really? She said, yeah, come on in. So we went in and we crashed a wedding and they would, nobody spoke English, but they were thrilled to have us. Um, she actually took us right in to meet the bride who was 16. Yeah. The groom was, I think he was like 18. They were very young, um, beautiful young woman. And she was so excited that we were there and we all said how it was probably the highlight of our trip and what they told us, what the tour company told us afterward was it was probably the highlight of their wedding and it would be talked about in that small village for generations because it was a very unique thing for 12 white women to jump off a bus and storm into uh, an Indian wedding. It was amazing. What about, <coughs> sorry, what about um, technology? So I'm thinking you're probably taking pictures uh, you ask permission before taking pictures and what about like, um, different use of technology, different places? Like I haven't traveled that much recently. I used to travel a lot, but like, uh, use of cell phones everywhere and how easy is it? It's really easy now. I mean, for me, because I'm, when I'm hosting, I'm still on business. So I like to be connected to my office and, I just pay the additional, I think it's $7 a day. So I get, I can use my phone just like I do at home. Um, I think you only get a hundred megs a 
data. But other than that, it's, you know, if I need to call or text or anything, it's very simple. Um, you know, there's WhatsApp for people that don't want to do that. And that works really great. We use our family. We all have a Google Hangout chat. So that's what I use. As long as I'm on Wi-Fi, we can use that. Well, I can use it anyway because I have my data on. But um, it's pretty easy. And I this last trip, I actually resorted to using Google Translate, which was amazing because at one point I actually had one, um, an emergency with one of my guests and I ended up having to take her to the hospital. And so I was able to communicate with the non-English speaking, completely non-English speaking cab driver using Google Translate. I asked him a question. He answered me. It was wonderful. That is so cool. So cool. Yeah. It's kind of like Star Trek, hey? I love Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Geeks unite. <laughs> okay. Uh, most interesting person you've taken on a trip? My mother. Really? <laughs> and why? She surprised me. I I expected, um, you know, I mean, my mom's very gregarious and outgoing, but, you know, within her social circle and with me, of course, what I didn't expect was for her to be that way with complete strangers and uh yeah it's great fun I love taking my mom and she's perfect demographic for our tours so yeah um friends you've made in other countries we often get to be really good friends with our tour guides our last tour to Italy we met Cinzia and she is just phenomenal she definitely will be coming to Canada someday um and she will come and stay with me if she comes um I met a lovely tour guide in India um, that we still, GK, we still keep in touch with. Um, You know, we do meet a lot of people through that. So um, if, if you were to go back and visit favorite country that you, or maybe top three countries? Well, India is my top. I don't know why. It just draws me back. I've been multiple times because it is my favorite country. Um, and I would say, I always say the last place I've been, yeah, you know, because it always, you know, it's fresh and you're excited about it. But I have to say Italy really, really was a real highlight for me. It, um, it was a bit of a departure in the sense that I normally do a little busier tours. So it, this was a little more stay put in each destination. So it was a little more relaxed than, than a normal, um, one of my normal tours. But um, it was just also, I think, so pristinely beautiful, much like home which I really enjoyed. And then other than that, I think South Africa was a real highlight for me. You know, the we did a safari, which was spectacular. We saw all of the big five. Um, and then the, the, you go down through the winelands and the garden route. And so such diverse topography and the people were so lovely. It was, it was a beautiful tour. Do you do anything in Canada? Um, you know, interesting enough, we do a little bit. Um, but the problem we have with Canada is Canada is more expensive than going somewhere else. So our hotels, if you look at the cost of hotels in Canada, um, comparatively, say, to go to Southeast Asia, they're probably triple the cost. So for us to run a Canadian tour costs more than for us to take somebody to somewhere like Southeast Asia. Well, maybe um, like a place like Newfoundland might be a good place. It wouldn't be that expensive, is it? It is in the season we would go in yeah it is so I mean absolutely we've done them and and they've been good we don't do them a lot and I think the other thing is most of the women that come on our tours are looking for something really adventurous and so they're looking to go somewhere they wouldn't do on their own which is why I think the tours that we do that are are the more adventurous destinations do so well and you you said you have tour guides so are not tour guides you have hosts how do how do you pick those hosts Mostly my personal connections. I get to know people really well. Sometimes it's people that have done a lot of tours with us, but mostly it's my personal connections. And quite a few are people that are in the industry. So my staff, um, Colleen Johnson, of course, has worked with me in the women's tours for all 15 years that I've been doing it. And so she hosts from time to time um, and, and others that are in the business. But the big thing with the tour hosts is they have to have the right personality. They have to be well-traveled and to be able to think faster than their feet if there were an emergency. There's rarely anything, but there has been a couple. So it's good to have somebody there. Well, I can testify, uh, attest, I mean, <laughs> to the 
tour, one tour I did with you, which was a kayaking tour and we had a red seal chef and we, um, they put me in a single kayak, which I had not <laughs> actually paddled for years. So that was interesting. And we had beautiful dinner and I remember the sunset and people going out on a paddle board, somebody doing a headstand. So it was really, 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 really nice. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. It's a lot of fun. I like that one too. <laughs> All right. So how do people get in touch with you? Um, they can go to the website, um, nichetravel.ca or departurestravel.com. They can phone me, 250-480-0008 is the niche line. That's probably the easiest to remember. Um, or email me at kathy at nichetravel.ca or kathy at departurestravel.com. So if you have any questions and you want more information about exemplary travel with Kathy Scott, please give her a call once again. Two five zero four eight zero triple zero eight, and uh, I want to hear about all your adventures, and I want those people to come back and be interviewed with me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, take care. Have a great day, and welcome to the neighborhood of Maplewood. I'm Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun and host of Vancouver Island Time. Bye. Welcome to the neighborhood. We hope you have had some insight into West Coast living. If you know of someone or some place that should be highlighted in our podcast, we love to hear from you. Please go to VancouverIslandTime.com and click on our Connect button. See you next week on Vancouver Island Time with Jane Johnston.